Hello, and welcome to the Linux Spotlight. This show is dedicated to showing off the best thing about Linux, our community. This community is made up of developers, distro maintainers, YouTubers, and everyday users. Each one plays a vital role in our community. And the goal is to have a discussion with each individual about their journey into Linux and beyond. So join me now as we turn the spotlight on. Hello, I'm your host Rocco and with me today, our special guest, my friend, Martin Wimpress. Hello there, Rocco. How are you doing? I am doing fabulous. It is Friday. I got coffee. I'm talking to you. I don't think it can get any better than that, brother. <laughs> Very kind. Yeah, well, I've <laughs> been looking forward to having a chat with you for ages. We, we get to do this about once a year or so, I think. This is always good fun. Yep. Well, you obviously don't need an introduction. Um, uh, the link list in the show notes will be probably as long or longer than Michael Tunnell's. <laughs> <laughs> and you've had titles like uh, developer advocate, uh, engineering manager for Snapcraft, uh, software engineer, co-founder and project lead of Ubuntu Mate, uh, podcaster, YouTuber, the list just goes on and on and on. So you recently moved into a new position and the title officially is the director of engineering of the Ubuntu desktop at Canonical, which basically says you're the desktop lead of the Ubuntu desktop. Um, all of that is what most people will know you by and be familiar with. But if you were talking to somebody that you never met and they didn't know who you were, who would you say Martin Wimpress is personally? Well, um, I'm just another bloke, really. I mean, I'm a husband, a father, um, hopeless technology geek and Linux desktop romantic. Very nice. Very nice. So you do so much work in the open and it's open to everybody. Uh, I, don't, I don't, honestly don't know how you find time for everything that you do. Do you have time to have other hobbies outside of Linux? Um, yes, I have. I have some, some hobbies outside of Linux, but they're, they don't occupy much of my time. So uh, I box, and uh, I used to be uh, a chef, and I, I still do the, the lion's share of the cooking uh, around the house. So that's one of my, my guilty pleasures in the evening is, uh, is cooking for the family. Very nice. A chef, huh? What was your, what was your favorite dish to make? Oh, wow. So many. Um, my mum taught me how to make uh, a mushroom and sherry sauce when I was a teenager, and uh, I really love that to this day. And uh, some pork belly with mushroom and sherry sauce is, uh, is one of my favorites. I really enjoy that. Well, I think some of the best recipes come from, you know, parents passed down and yeah. passed down from generations. So, yeah, that's, all, that's awesome. So... You've been making the rounds on the podcast, on YouTube channels for interviews. Um, one of the recent ones that is that you appeared on a JB Extra show called Brunch with Brent, uh, which was fantastic. Um, you went into a lot of your history, and Brent does such a great job at making the conversation feel like it's a one-on-one -on -one and nobody else is listening. You know, he, he um, makes everybody basically feel comfortable. And I suggest people go listen to that interview because it's fabulous. Um, you also appeared on two Destination Linux episodes where we talked about your history and your background. But this is uh, your Linux Spotlight episode. So I want to uh, apologize for going over the same things maybe that you've talked about on other shows. But I want this to be a place where if you want to know about somebody's history in Linux, you come to the Linux Spotlight. So tell us about that interview with Brunch with Brent. Yeah, that was really good fun. Like you say, he's got a, a great style for striking up um, a conversation that takes many roads and, and, you know, deviates off, you know, off the path of, you know, what you would traditionally, you know, chat to somebody about, you know, when, 
people want to talk to me, it's usually was revolves around something to do with desktop Linux. And we got into, you know, a number of different topics there. And, you know, it's fun to talk about, you know, stuff that you, uh, you don't talk about, you know, generally. And, you know, I think it's nice, you know, I like knowing more about the people that I follow. Um, you know, there are lots of people involved in and around the communities that I'm interested in. I always love to find out more about, you know, their personality and uh, their, their other interests, because you may find out that, you know, they share an interest in music that you have or something. So it's always good. Yep. It's definitely one of the best things to see what other people are interested in and you know man that that is so cool i like that you know um but you also appeared on ig's infinitely galactic's youtube channel for a really informative interview um and it was basically about you know snaps the desktop and ubuntu um but i think that interview is very important for people to see because you went deep into snaps itself and the progression of them uh and it was, I think in, I think I would say that it encapsulized uh, snaps in a talk where you were answering all of the questions, basically, that people could have about snaps mm -hmm. in one spot. Right. So it's interesting you think that that was a deep dive because really only touched the surface even then. Um, there's, there's so much to that topic. And Alan, Pipe and uh, Alan Pope and I have been, you know, uh, working on this stuff for uh, two and a half, three years now. And um, we've been advocating for it in some, you know, high profile organizations bringing, bringing their applications to the Snap Store. So we know a lot of stuff. There's an awful lot in our heads. And it's very difficult when we start talking about Snaps not to just sort of... Ugh! <laughs> <laughs> you know and still be talk, talking an hour later because there's there's a, it's a deep topic um and yeah i think ig did a good job of, of summarizing the questions we most commonly see in and around the community that uh we try to answer when they come by us but you don't hit a large audience of people when you're replying you know in twitter threads and what have you there's you know literally you know a handful of people that may see that We've tried writing, you know, blog posts in uh, publications outside of Ubuntu in order to broaden the message. Yeah. And a couple of those have been picked up by people. And, you know, I've, I've written for a couple of uh, sites uh, recently talking about Snap. And people are like, huh, well, I never knew these things about Snap until I read that article. But um, I did, uh, I was at UbuCon, um, I don't know, about a month ago. And I did two talks there about snaps. Uh, one was uh, a talk that Alan and I uh, sort of uh, developed together, which is, it has a couple of titles, but uh, one is, it's just called Why Snaps? And it's looking back at, you know, 15 years of software delivery uh, at Ubuntu and how, how we arrived at the idea of creating snaps. And we talk about all of the issues and problems that we've experienced over those years at Ubuntu and how Snap solved some of those problems. Um, and that is an enlightening talk for a lot of people in the community because it touches, it, it hopefully answers all of the questions they have in their mind without them having to ask all of those questions. And then um, the other session that I've done a few times at UbuCon over the last um, three years is um, an AMA. Um, you know, ask me anything about snaps. Um, and I did one of those as well. I am halfway through that AMA uh, for snaps. Right. And maybe I used the wrong wording for um, the IG interview. Uh, maybe not as a deep dive, but like you said, it answered a lot of the questions that most people have mm -hmm. about snaps. Uh, but the AMA is fantastic, but it is really a deep dive into snaps. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that 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 one was literally, you know, go as deep as you want to ask me. So, um, I th that AMA talk is available, and you know, one of the topics there is a real technical discussion about, you know, how to optimize a snap. Do you include pre-compiled Python bytecode? Yes or no? You know, it was, you know, you could yeah. ask me anything as surface level as you like, or we can really go deep. And and that that talk is really well. 
I say talk, it was a conversation with a group of people. But that really sort of hits all the high points of complexity and some of the, you know, more straightforward things as well. Yes, no slides, no slides. <laughs> no, uh, and th this is something that I've learned about those AMAs. I have um, a screen there in case I need to pull something up for reference. Um, but when I've done it this time, and I did it 18 months ago um, at UbuCon, I found I didn't actually need to reference anything on the Snapgraph IO website because we do this stuff so often now, it's just in, in our heads and we've got like literally sort of instant recall on all of this <laughs> stuff now. Well, uh, the last thing I'm going to touch on in that interview with IG was uh, Linux being successful in attracting more users. And that was mm -hmm. a question that he posed and you were talking about. And I thought it was, it's not the normal answer that you hear. And, you know, tell us about that whole scenario of Linux being successful. Um, I feel like um, we spend a lot of time chasing what Mac OS and Windows are already doing. And if we're chasing that down, I don't feel we're going to be successful because they're already doing it. You know, what's the, what's the value proposition? What is the compelling reason why people would switch from Mac OS and Windows to something that's a bit like Mac OS and Windows? Um, and I really feel that the Linux desktop, whatever that might be, you know, I'm not in a particular desktop environment here perhaps i'm thinking of one that doesn't exist yet but i feel like you know the linux desktop needs to offer something truly distinctive and compelling that sets itself apart from windows and mac os because whatever that compelling thing is is the reason why people would choose to run desktop linux and when i was talking to ig you know i said i think the closest we came to that in the past um, was Compiz, um, for all of its, you know, um, frippery and fire animations and all the rest of it. <laughs> Which was awesome. You know, the, the wobbly windows and the spinning cube, the only place you could get that was Linux. And at that time, you saw people playing with Linux uh, and a real energy forming around it because of Compiz and because of those features because the only place you could experience that was on the Linux desktop. So we need something as uh, sexy as that, you know, something that drives people to use it. But I think it needs to be a more meaningful. You know, that Compiz was kind of a science project, you know, a bit of a tech demo. Um, it's, it's proven that the technologies that were developed under the hood for, you know, X11 have stood the test of time and have been uh, e e extremely important to, you know, the, the Linux desktop special effects aside but um yeah we need something compelling and i'm not sure i know exactly what that is yet but it's something i'm giving some thought because now i'm in a position where you know we can really try and move the needle on that so yeah yeah some some strategic thinking required that's it so do you get tired of answering the same questions all the time um no i don't actually um they're always posed in a different way and also things move so quickly so a question that i may have been asked you know even a few months earlier my my answer today may be quite different or you know there is some new information but that means my answer is slightly different so no it it, it doesn't bother me and you know there are people that will be watching this who have no idea who i am and this will be the first time they've they've heard me seen me talk about things and I think it's important that they, they get, you know, some consistency of information so that we're all caught up, you know, with, with everyone else who may have heard me tell these stories and say these things in the past. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes I think, you know, like you have joined Biddle on the Europe edition and some of the regular editions, and sometimes you get asked the same questions that you've answered before. Um, and I'm even a culprit of that, you know. Uh, but I just think, man, it's got to be tired answering this question. <laughs> No, I mean, I think it comes with the territory. Maybe, maybe there's a certain personality trait that's that that's fine with that. You know, I I do enjoy um, interacting with the community. I mean, that, that sounds a bit dehumanising. I like talking to people. You know, it doesn't matter whether it's you know one to one like we're doing here, or if somebody's asking questions on Twitter. Um, I prefer that people ask questions of me in a public place 
so that other people can find the answers and you know it has some some reuse um i'm not a super fan of people just sending me dms or direct messages on telegram because whatever that conversation is uh, the only person that benefits is the other person and i don't have enough of me to spread around to help everybody at an individual level but if somebody's asking a question of me in a public forum you know be it on twitter or a user forum or you know maybe one of your um uh, biddle sessions where there's you know 20 to 30 people and then hundreds or thousands of people watching it after the fact then no i've no objection to answering those questions many times over because each time we do that more people uh get an answer and hopefully it helps them or improves their understanding or you know whatever so no i'm i'm fine with that yeah, it's some way i never looked at it before so yeah i can see that um before we get too deep into the Linux area, let's go back to your beginning and where you started in computers. So oh, wow. what was the first computer you touched? The first computer I touched was a Dragon 32. Which what is I... that? <laughs> <laughs> I knew you would say that because they were manufactured in Wales and I don't know if they sold anywhere outside of the United Kingdom. Maybe they had some sales uh, in in uh, other parts of Europe, but I think they may have been predominantly a UK thing. So that would have been one of the very early computers. So this was, I don't know if it predated the ZX Spectrum. It certainly predated the Commodore 64 and the VIC-20. Um, so I think it would have been 1980-ish, 1980. And our next door neighbor, who were friends of the family, had this Dragon 32. And that was the very first time I had come into contact with a computer or anything like it. You know, I think I play, maybe played the Atari 2600 console at, um, at a family, uh, someone, you know, someone who, you know, one of the young members of the family had, had one of those. But the Dragon was an 8 bit computer. And I can remember playing. Uh, Wally goes walkabout on this thing and <laughs> just being, goes yeah, and just uh, be, being absolutely captivated by it. Um, it had a joystick that was analog, and when you moved the joystick, it, it just held the position that you put it in, and it had like 360 degrees of, of movement. So, this game, which was walking around, you know, squares, you had to be very precise in order to actually, you know, get it to, <laughs> you know, if you were off by a couple of degrees, it was no good. Yeah. Um, but even that, and that, that really, that was the thing. That was the moment when I realized I, uh, this, I liked that. I liked the computer and I, I must've made a pain of myself for months because I was always asking if I could go around next door to, you know, have a go on Peter's computer. And he was very accommodating, letting me, you know, sit in their upstairs bedroom playing on this, this computer. Uh, so that that's where it all started, and I think my my mum and dad realised that this was something I was interested in, um, and then that Christmas um, they got me a Vic Twenty, and that was my first computer of my own. Very nice, very nice. So take us a little bit through the progression then of your computers um, as you're getting into school and college and whatnot. Right. Well, I had I had the Vic Twenty, and I had the uh, that had three and a half k of RAM. Uh, and I had wow. a 16K RAM pack, uh, which in reality was actually useless because there was literally nothing that supported that. So it was an expensive bit of kit that did nothing. But I learned, I sort of self-taught myself basic with that using uh, Input Magazine. If, uh, if you're in the UK and you're of my generation, you will know what that was. That was a weekly magazine that had programming examples for all of the popular home computers at the time. So for the, for the Spectrums, for the VIC-20, for the Oric-1, for the Dragon 32 and the Dragon 64 and the BBC Micro, you know, there was pages and pages of stuff. And it mostly revolved around BASIC. Um, so I, I learned that. And then from there... Um, years pass and i i have a stream of random 8-bit computers until i got a commodore 64 and then i got quite serious about programming there 
uh, and learned um, 6502 assembler and started um, uh, writing terrible computer games. <laughs> um, they Are they were, still around? <laughs> got, well, the, yeah. I mean, I, I wrote a couple of games for budget labels in the UK. They were technically sound in that, you know, I was making good use of the facilities. In fact, I wrote some games for the VIC-20 as well. They were technically sound. They were making good use of the video and audio chips in the computer. Uh, but a game designer, I was not. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, whilst um, I enjoyed that, I, I, was, I, I was making terrible games. So I switched to making uh, just uh, engines, audio, music, and uh, graphics engines for, um, for other studios who were working on projects. So I would, I would just come in and, and work on like um, back-end stuff. So they would have game designers and graphics designers and musicians and what have you. And I would just create the, the well, what, what you would now call functions and things to, to implement you know, game, game capabilities. And a lot of that was thinking about how the memory was fragmented and where you would load your routines into memory to maximize the space that was available for the main execution of the program and where, you know, you would load sprites and music into because it, was, it wasn't contiguous or anything. So, yeah, I did that for many years. Um, and then, then thought, well, the natural progression was the Amiga when the Amiga came along. And um, I loved the Amiga, but it was a much more sophisticated machine. And I wasn't a very sophisticated uh, programmer <laughs> back then. Um, so I had one very briefly, and it didn't really jive with me. Uh, and about that same time, my dad got a PC from, from work so that he could um, work from home. Uh, this is, you know, this is in the 80s. So this is, was quite progressive for the time. Anyway, right. the thing about my dad is um, he was obviously being offered a computer, which he, uh, he obviously w wanted to have, but my dad knew nothing about computers whatsoever. So this was a wasted acquisition on him because he, he simply didn't know how to use it. And this was in the days where Windows was not, you know, um, dominant. It was mostly you would run DOS applications. So this thing was installed with a version of DOS. I can't remember if it was version two based or version three based, but this was all brand new to me. And one of the first things I did as I was sort of learning how to use this computer was whilst formatting a floppy disk. So I thought managed to format the hard disk instead. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh no! <laughs> I, this computer that had been given to my dad for his work, there was nothing on it at that point <laughs> and all i had was uh, a dos manual and the floppy disks to install dos so not wanting to admit my mistake i very quickly <laughs> became an expert in ms dos and managed to reinstall <laughs> reinstall ms dos and then i had to learn about you know well it, the keyboard wasn't mapped correctly because it defaulted to a us keyboard layout so i had to read the manuals and figure out how you use config.sys and autoexec.bat to configure the keyboard layout, configure the fonts so they're the correct fonts, and just a whole bunch of stuff. And from memory of what this computer was doing, I was able to, over the course of a couple of weeks, recreate it and get everything working. And then at that point, as I'd been learning, I realized uh, that the default configuration wasn't all that optimal so i then got into learning more about it um and you know subsequent versions of dos i became quite expert with i think when dos 5 came along and you use um high memory and umb memory i got quite quite sophisticated at manually configuring the way things were loaded to maximize the available memory um for you know basically getting games to work back then so yeah, that was that was sort of you know eight bit computers through to PCs, yeah. um, and that would have been that was an eight o eight eight. So I think that was an eight bit Intel um, PC back then. I think it just had the base six hundred and forty k of memory. That one, 
So you became an expert at a necessity. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, you know, I was panicked the whole time thinking, you know, if my dad wants to use this computer, what's he, what's he going to do? Because, you know, it, it doesn't work. But he never, ever used that computer. It was basically mine from that point onward. Um, uh, yeah. So that was, that was the early days. That sort of takes us up to sort of 1990, something like that, I suppose, maybe 1989. Right. Well, you went to the University of Reading for computer science. Mm -hmm. And before that, you went to the University of Hertfordshire. And yes. you were on the football team. Yes. So I take it that means it's the round football kind and not the regular football kind? No, uh, it wasn't <laughs> the soccer team, as you would say. Although I did play uh, soccer uh, into my mid-20s. No, the football team I was on at university was Gridiron. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah. So yeah, I was a linebacker. Um, and after so what then, you would call real football. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, it was, it was new to me, right? I think at that time, um, the American football had started being broadcast on, on one of the channels in the UK, like, like uh, channel four or something. And certainly the NFL was being broadcast on one of those channels. So that, and there'd been a few, uh, exhibition games played at you know Wembley and stuff like this to try try and build some interest in American football in the UK. So it, it was kind of um, fashionable at the time, and there was somebody um, at um, Hatfield. So you say the, it, the University of Hertfordshire. That's what it's known as now. But when I actually started going there, it's called Hatfield Polytechnic. Oh. Um, and whilst I was there, it was when UK. I had this transition where everything that was a polytechnic became a university. Um, so I just call it Hatfield or Hatfield Poly. But there was someone there who had been playing American football uh, for a few years and had been coaching. And so he started this American football team at the, at the Poly. And uh, we, uh, I thought, well, that sounds like fun. You know, I've, I've played rugby. I quite enjoy rugby. I'll give this a go. It was something different. And I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I played there for a couple of years and then uh, played at a local town when I finished for a couple of years, played down at Southampton for a couple of years afterwards really? as well. Yeah. You didn't have any interest in uh, going any further with that, huh? Um, no, it was, it was kind of frustrating. There weren't a great deal of teams. So the travel for games was quite, you know, quite, quite a long but when you played that weekend you, you were basically giving your whole weekend over to it right and there was other things i wanted to be doing back then so it just didn't didn't fit so uh it, it was a short-lived thing but i enjoyed it all, all the same well on your bio it also says that you raised money for the rag week hitchhike so what is that <laughs> <laughs> okay i i ass assume this is still a thing so rag week is a week in the university calendar where all universities have a week of um, charitable activities. So this can be, it, it, the, the whole thing is you pick your charities and as a university, you do a whole bunch of things to try and raise money for whatever the charities are you want to support. And a traditional feature of Rag Week is a rag hitchhike. So the one that we had at uh, ours, the, the challenge was to hitchhike as far away from the university and back in 48 hours. And whoever got the farthest would win a case of beer. <laughs> so me and my friends saw the opportunity to win a case of beer. <laughs> and then... Uh, an inordinate amount of planning into ensuring we were going to win this thing in order to win beer. So you need to remember this is before the internet, right? And this is before mobile phones. Yep. So, um, you know, researching this stuff is hard. So anyway, the first thing we do is we go to the uh, campus library and we calculate very precisely. I can't remember the name of the place. But there is a town on the North Island of New Zealand, which is precisely opposite Hatfield on the globe. 
So this is this is where we want to get to, right? Because you <laughs> you cannot get any farther away <laughs> from the university <laughs> than this exact point on Earth. So we started trying to figure that out, and then, like I say, no internet. So uh, by phoning airlines, we found out we couldn't do that trip there and back in the 48 hour window that wasn't so then we were like oh well okay so then we were thinking and then a friend of ours whose father was in the raf that's the royal air force um he had found out that they had like mail flights and he'd got a jump seat on um a military aircraft that was delivering mail from the uk to an air force base in poland so we knew our friend Andy was going to Poland. So we were like, how do we best Poland? So we started phoning around the airlines, um, which in itself was challenging because how do you uh, contact the right people at these airlines? Yeah. But we went through all of that process and we, we did get a, a conversation going with Virgin and they were interested in what we were trying to do but weren't able to help. Um, but they put us in touch with Northwest Airlines and they did offer us. So the whole point about the racket, you can't spend any money to get to your destination and back again. So they gifted us tickets to fly to Minnesota St. Paul. <laughs> so <laughs> we uh, hitchhike from Hatfield Polytechnic down to the airport. I can't remember if it was Gatwick or Heathrow. Um, and then fly. So there's five of us organizing this, but we've only got two tickets. So we draw lots as to who's going to go. And it was me and one of the other guys. So three of them didn't get to go. Um, and because of the planning involved, people knew we were doing this. And we'd obviously been going around the campus explaining that we were, we were part of this and we intended to win it. And it was, you know, people were donating money, but we didn't tell anyone where we were going because we knew we thought we were going further than anyone else. Um, but the American football coach <laughs> uh, was saying, "Well, where are you going? You know, if you're going to America, I want to, I want you to do something for me." So we kind of fessed up. Yes, we were going to America, but we didn't say where. Um, and he um, went and had some dollars. Uh, you know, did a transaction to get dollars. Uh, and he wanted a authentic NFL American football. So me and my mate, we were on this plane. Um, we fly all the way to Minnesota, St. Paul. The stewardesses on that flight, basically we strike a conversation with them and we explain what they're up to. So they're like, right, we'll help with that. So they then helped ferry us from the airport to the Mall of America in Minnesota. And we had six hours in the Mall of America where we went and ate the biggest uh, Whopper I've ever had in my life <laughs> and then went to you know a sports retailer and buy this American football. And then the stewardesses, having gone home and changed, then pick us up and drive us back to the airport and get us back on the same, same plane that we'd arrived on. <laughs> And we fly, we fly all the way back to London again, and then we hitchhike back from the airport to to the Polytechnic. And sure enough, um, we we did travel the farthest, and we raised a bit over a thousand pounds for um, for the Rag Week um, charity competition. So this uh, football that you were supposed to get. Mm -hmm. um this was a side thing so but did you have to offer any proof of where you had went uh we did how did we do that oh well, that was quite complicated because again uh cameras had film in them so we took a camera and we took photographs but then we had to go and get that film developed <laughs> and that, that takes like a week at back, back then you know it was... so yes we did we had photographs uh at various points of our journey in order to prove this yeah yeah um and our friends did get to poland and back as well you know uh, and it was a lot of fun uh, but in the end we we didn't even bother turning up to the awards ceremony to collect our case of beer so, so what started out as this <laughs> grand plan in order to win a case of beer we never did get the beer it was <laughs> hey, the things you do mm -hmm. yep well i mean 
that was uh, obviously in college. So, but your list of courses that you've taken over the years has been extensive. Mm -hmm. um, is there one or two that maybe stand out to you that were pivotal for you and your career? Uh, yes. So when I worked at Sun Microsystems, it was a requirement that everyone did a training course um, on analytic problem solving, which is a discipline created by Kepner Trago. So they're a consulting firm, and this is um, a particular way of approaching problems and uh, a method of isolating what the problem is. And this has, it's been the most valuable um, course I've done in my career. I use Kepner Trago to this day. The books are right next to me, as are the little crib cards that you use. And it's really a common sense approach and a methodology to identify what the problem is, uh, the sequence of events, when things happened, knowing that you need more information or more data in order to take your investigation further. And this has been so useful on many, many occasions. It's, it's brilliant. Um, you know, in some of the roles I've been in, I've, I've used it multiple times a week. Uh, it's great. And then I suppose the other that was important to my career at the time is I did the um, CISSP um, qualifications in the early 2000s. And I was working as a, an information security analyst at the time. And this was the, it may, may still be the only professional qualification for information security. And uh, without doubt, the most demanding educational undertaking I've ever done. You know, it, it transcended everything that I'd done at school and university. Uh, it was tough, and the exam is a six-hour uh, written exam. Wow. It's um, it's really hard, and uh, you have to score over eighty percent to pass. So that, that um, counts me out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that was pretty extreme. Uh, and but that was that meant that I was able to pursue my career at the time, which was working as an information security analyst. And then I went on to work as a vulnerability analyst. So, you know, actually uh, looking at the, you know, looking at code and trying to find holes in the code. And uh, I was working at a pharmaceutical company and we had, you know, Linux and Unixes and Windows and OS2 and Cisco switches and Lotus Notes and Microsoft, just everything you can imagine. And it was fun uh, looking and managing all of that. Well, if you could give advice to somebody looking into development, um, would those be the ones that you would say are, you know, what you must do? Um... I think Kepner Trago is something that would be useful to anybody, and it doesn't matter what your profession is. I think Kepner Trago, it's not anything to do with IT. Uh, it's applicable to IT, but it's applicable to lots of other things. I mean, some of the workshops we were doing at the time were actually uh, um, figuring out like uh, issues with plumbing problems. And I'm not a plumber. In fact, I'm the world's worst plumber. I don't touch plumbing at all. Um, but, you know, it was a pl plumbing problems or, or things to do with um, uh, air stewards on an aircraft and, and a sequence of events that were happening. So Captain Trago is just genuine, genuinely useful. If you want to be a developer, I mean, I, I was taught proper computer science when I did my A-levels in secondary school and then when I went to university. And understanding those principles of, you know, um, classic computer programming, object oriented programming, and today you'll cover stuff like, you know, functional programming as well. I think those are important concepts that everyone needs to have an appreciation of if you want to be a software developer, but they're only applicable to people if you want to be a software developer. Um, yeah, I, 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 w I wasn't the best student. I spent far too much time drinking beer and uh, thinking up crazy schemes to travel you know, travel to America for <laughs> free. <laughs> it was pretty much what I spent most of my time doing. 
Well, on your uh, LinkedIn page, uh, the first entry, and I don't know if that was your first job or not, but it was the first entry is an industrial trainee for a company called ICL Logistics. Right. So can you tell us how you got started on that journey that led to today? Yeah. So it's not quite my first job, but this was the point at which I decided I was going to pursue computing. I I'd spent a year or so uh, working as a chef, so that doesn't show up on my on my. Oh you should my put it background. on there, dude. That that's awesome, though. That's like an awesome feature. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. That that's now personal interest. You know, I they, 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 I'm never gonna um, I'm a chef again. Nobody needs to know that I I once did that. <laughs> um, so I wanted to go to university to study computer science or software engineering, as it turned out, and it was an expensive undertaking to go to university. Um, the it was not as expensive then as it is now i i feel for students now they're they they're crippled with debt if they want to go to university and i was aware of that so i wanted to limit my you know the the the, the difficulties i was going to get into financially <clears throat> and i did qualify for a grant for the educational fees but i didn't qualify for any grants for you know accommodation or subsistence or anything like that so again, this is before the internet existed. So this information was hard to come by, but I found out through some sort of, you know, bulletin, literal, you know, pin, pin paper to a board, bulletin board, about this sponsored student scheme that ICL um, were running. And ICL in the UK back then, they were like a smaller but similar equivalent to IBM. You know, they did they did all sorts of stuff with computers. You know, they 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 were competing with IBM in the mainframe market and a whole bunch of other stuff, including, you know, desktop PCs and, you know, mini computers and all sorts. So I applied to be a sponsored student and I had to have an aptitude test to make sure that I could read and write and do sums and all the rest of it. <laughs> um, and I successfully uh, uh, got through that. And what that meant was is that I got a, um, an amount per month from ICL because I was being sponsored. And then in the long holidays that you get in the university, I would then work at one of their facilities and I would, you know, work for them. So that meant that, you know, Easter, summer and Christmas holidays, I was basically working at ICL. And um, that meant that I was, I had some money coming in to offset, you know, my other expenses for accommodation and what have you. And I think my monthly budget was like £105 and £50 of that was on my accommodation. So, <laughs> and the rest was probably beer, <laughs> beer and noodles, as I remember. I think that was pretty much my diet <laughs> at the time. Um, and uh, as I was working at ICL, I was having difficulty squaring some of the stuff I was being taught on the computer science course with what I was experiencing, you know, in the workplace. So after a year, I switched, and that's when I switched from uh, Hatfield, the University of Hertfordshire, and I went to Reading, and I switched from a from computer science to software engineering. Software engineering is basically programming you know it's stuff like you know database administration and programming is really you know what it boils down to uh, and i was much happier with that so i then concluded those studies there in fact i didn't conclude them i did another year of full time but then i was getting frustrated with um i was enjoying more the workplace stuff i was enjoying well more what i was do doing with ico when i got to work there so then instead of doing a third year um, full-time education, I switched and I basically started working for ICL and just one day a week for the next two years, I went to university to do the course that I was doing. So I was working four days a week and one day a week I was going to university, completing my course material and all the rest of it. So at the end of those four years, I had my qualifications, but more importantly, at that time, just about every job you applied for in IT back then, it demanded these qualifications and two years experience. And I was very fortunate that I came out of that 
process with the requisite experience, the qualifications, and I wasn't saddled with a load of debt. Um, yep. So uh, I was very, very lucky. Um, and I worked for ICL for, for several years in different different divisions before I finally moved on. So where in this all do you hear about Linux? When's the first time you hear the word Linux? It was while I was working at ICL. I'd, I'd moved, as you said, I was at ICL Logistics, which was basically um, uh, the thing, the warehouse that built the mainframes and then shipped those mainframes to the customers is where I was working. And I moved to ITL retails, ICL retail systems. And they made the till systems that you find in shops, you know, the barcode scanners, the till systems connected to the back office system that does the perpetual warehouse inventory, just in time ordering and all of that stuff. So I was a developer working on that. And when I was uh, working there, we had some guys who were operating a web server. Now, we didn't have an interconnected, the, the, there was no internet, <laughs> <laughs> and there was no um, IP network that interconnected the offices. So this web server just served the building that I was in. Uh, but I was fascinated by this, and because I was predominantly working on Unix and OS2 at the time, I got some exposure to this web server. And... It was while I was talking to these guys about, well, how did you set this up? You know, I want to try and set one up for myself. Um, that they, I, they then explained, oh, well, one of the one of the old Unix servers they were actually running Linux on. Uh, and I was like, well, what's Linux? And they're like, well, it's like, it's similar to this Unix, but it's free. And that was the key thing for me back then because I was, I joined. ICL through this industrial placement program. So although I'd finished my qualifications and I was working for them, my wages were really, really low. I was earning a pitiful amount of money, <laughs> barely, barely enough to uh, scrape by. So I couldn't afford by any margin the um, almost £1,000 license for SCO Unix, which was really the only option for running on like a desktop um, Intel PC back at, at that time. Um, so when they said oh, it's free, I was like, hmm, this is interesting. Because I, I was quite enjoying working on, on Unix. So that's when I heard about it. And then I found out about a guy that worked in one of our offices two towns over had floppy disk images on his PDP-7. So I took a day off work to go to his office with boxes of floppy disks and copied those floppy disks off, off his mini computer uh, to my laptop uh, so that I could then raw write them onto, uh, so, you know, serial cable doing X modem <laughs> copies of like 27 <laughs> floppy disks, which would have been great if I'd remembered to have put the transfer into binary mode before I started, which I'd forgotten to do. Uh, so I actually had 27 corrupt floppy disk images oh, at the end of that man. exercise. And two weeks later, I went back and did it all again. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, this is a, this was at like 9,600 board. So, you know, it was, it was a pain. It took hours to copy these blooming images. I'm sure. Um, and then, then the journey started. So at that point I had floppy disks, no internet, because that didn't exist. Uh, it kind of existed, but it was difficult to access back then. And uh, a large dot matrix printout of the the manual for um, Idrisil Linux. And that was what I was going to ask you. What was it? Yeah, it was Idrisil Linux, which I didn't realize at the time, but it had already been discontinued and was two years out of date. Oh my gosh! <laughs> well, how did I mean? How was that experience? What were the good things and the bad things about? um that whole thing well the good thing was i did install linux and i did get you know a linux terminal and i got had a multitasking environment that was what i was really after i wanted a proper multitasking operating system windows was at that time was not a proper multitasking operating system um an os2 kind of was and that was my main operating system at the time uh os2 
um, but that didn't have the Unix stuff I wanted. And it didn't have enough of the Windows stuff that people, you know, had, and it didn't have enough of the DOS stuff. So I was, I, I was not fully happy with it. Uh, and what Linux enabled me to do was actually get on the internet. So um, I was part of um, uh, an initial group to uh, join Demon Internet back in the day and get online with that. And Linux was the way that I was able to send and receive email. And I had an FTP client built in by default. And I had a Usenet client built in by default. This is before the web existed. You know, there were no web browsers. There was no World Wide Web. There was, you know, um, Archie and uh, plan files and all of that sort of stuff. So this was, you know, real and Gopher. You know, this was real early days, and that's how I how I got on the internet. So that was important to me at the time. So, where do you go from there as far as Linux distros? Do you try other ones? Well, once I'd so I'd installed Idrisil. I just assumed that, you know, not knowing anything about it, I assumed, well, that was it. You know, that was this version and there'll be another version at some point. And it was some months between installing it and getting on the internet. But I was regularly connecting to bulletin board systems. And I found a couple of bulletin board systems that specialized in Linux related stuff. And that's where I learned that the Idrisil Linux release I had was not only discontinued, but was well out of date. And so that's where I started to learn about, well, how do you get more up-to-date versions? And at the time, Slackware was, was it. So I racked up a quite horrific telephone bill at my mum and dad's house downloading Slackware floppy disk images from a bulletin board system <laughs> um, for much of a weekend whilst they were on holiday somewhere, I seem to remember. Um, and from there, I, I switched my Idrisil to Slackware and I used Slackware for quite some years after that. Um, this would have been, I was probably running Slackware 95, 96. And I think I stuck with it through to 1999, something like that. Yep. Very nice. So how long does it, I mean, is that you, you're running Slackware. Are you not running windows at all? Um, I, well, I was using windows cause where I was working, it was pretty much all windows on the desktop and windows, um, NT servers. And I was, a windows, um, enterprise architect for my day job at that time. So I was familiar with windows. I had a laptop and I was dual booting Slackware and probably windows nt4 at that time yeah and i was dual booting those so i had nt4 for doing work stuff and i had slackware for like personal interest and then at home i had um a desk side computer that dual booted as well so i was i was dual booting and that was really because um i needed windows to do my job you know there was there, there was simply no way to use linux to connect to you know, a Windows um, domain and manage it back then. How long does it take before you get to be Linux only? Um, it was probably around 2002, something like that. So I made the switch from Slackware to Crux Linux, which is a uh, build from source distribution. Uh, I think it's still going today, and Crux is sort of cited as the inspiration for Arch Linux. Um, okay. And if you look at a PKG build file for Crux today, you can see it's very similar to a PKG build file in Arch. And in some cases, Crux PKG builds today will still will build on on Arch Linux. There's enough similarity there. So I started using Crux and. I got to the point where Wine was able to run Lotus Notes. And Lotus Notes was like ev everything that I was in the company I was working on at that time. If you had Lotus Notes, it was a bit like having a web browser today. If you could get Lotus Notes working, you could pretty much do every 
everything you needed to do. So at that point, um, I was using Linux on my laptop at work as my only OS, and I had a second workstation on my desk, which was my Windows box. I did Windows, you know, network administration stuff on. Um, but in terms of my own, not my own, because it was a company laptop, but in terms of, you know, what I was choosing to use on the computer that I carried around with me everywhere, at that point, I was only using Linux. So um, do you use Windows or Mac now? Um, interesting question. So I've recently bought a secondhand MacBook Pro, um, like, I don't know, about four months ago, something like that. And that's the first Mac I've ever owned. And the reason I've, I did that is we have a number of products at work which run on Mac OS. And they're products that I use, like Snapcraft and Multitask. So I actually wanted to be able to test and use those on Mac OS because when we have Snapcraft summits and we invite developers from the community and you know big organizations, most of them have Mac OS as their development platform. So I wanted to get familiar with what that workflow was like on Mac OS. Um, and I have had, it's down here, a crusty old hand-me-down computer that had Windows 7 on it. And the only reason I had that was for updating firmware on devices that you can only update the firmware on using Windows. So I've got these uh, remote control things for uh, home cinema. And the only way you can update that is over a serial port using Windows. It doesn't work on Wine. So I use it for that. And I use it for updating the firmware on diving watches and just random devices that you need to be able to update from time to time. Now, since I've got the MacBook Pro, all of that software that I used to use on Windows, I now use on the Mac. So the Mac has now become that when I need to update something, like I got a new camera recently and it needed a firmware update, and the only way you could do that is either Windows or Mac, I now use Mac, the Mac for all of that updating devices. Um, but I have to set a timer every time I get that Mac out so I don't get too sucked in because it's <laughs> um it's it's i can see the appeal i mean yep. it is a very polished experience um so yeah and i literally do set a timer so i don't spend too time because i re i recreated my linux workflow on mac os i literally went from knowing nothing about mac os to being able to do a full install and setting up all of my scripts and configuration files getting all of my applications on there. And I was like, well, I could start using this as my computer that I do all of my tasks. on." It's, it's, it's very, very, very good. Yeah. It's very good. Yeah. I mean, it's not a popular opinion in the Linux world, but um, it is a very polished system. Mm -hmm. And it, it, the convergence that it has between an iPhone and Mac OS is, I'm sorry, it's absolutely awesome. Yes, um, I don't have any other Apple products. I have friends that have, you know, Apple laptops and iPhones and uh, like Apple TV. And the harmony that exists between all of those Apple products is simply marvelous. You know, it is excellent. And, you know, really, Apple deserve every success that they've had because they have really you know nailed the execution on on that and you know maybe it's that you know very well integrated ecosystem of devices is that compelling feature that they have that brings people to that platform that is you know that 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 compelling thing that we need you know in Linux, not that particular thing right but as compelling in order to bring people to the Linux desktop. Yep, I agree. Absolutely agree. But we better get off that subject or we'll <laughs> get people upset. <laughs> yeah, people hitting dislike right now. We're talking uh, about right. Um so working at Canonical, uh what is the typical day in the life of Martin Wimpress? Um well, 
it's changed a little bit recently, but um, it usually starts with um, a call uh, first thing in the morning uh, with uh, the team that I'm on, and we catch up on what we're going to do that day, uh, what we did the previous day, and any help that we might need. Um, and then there's a number of calls like that. So we're all in different parts of the world. We're all in different places. So how we're talking now, this is how I interact with people. You know, this is this is normal. This is what the work looks like now. So uh, in and out of video calls all day to talk to people. Um, so instead of, you know, go, going up two floors in the office and finding John and having a chat at John's desk, you ping somebody on IRC or Telegram and say, hey, can we have a quick chat about whatever? And you just stand up a call like this and you talk about things and you agree what you're going to do. And in between, you know, these conversations where um, you're agreeing what it is you're going to do and how you're going to collaborate on a thing, you're actually doing it, you know, so either writing code or preparing a presentation or, you know, writing some documentation or, you know, going through the forum and replying to people that have had difficulties with, you know, a particular thing or are asking questions. So it's quite a broad role. You know, the, the stuff that the advocacy team does is really broad. You know, we can be talking to a significant software publisher, uh, helping them bring their application to the Snap Store, Snap Store and working alongside them on that stuff you know at an engineering level sometimes fixing bugs in their their applications along the way and that could be you know cloud related stuff it could be desktop related applications it could be iot related applications it's very varied and one of the things that i enjoyed about that role um and then now on the desktop team it's a similar arrangement but obviously you know the focus is on on desktop and we're now also putting a lot of effort behind um wsl so hayden barnes has joined the team recently um and he's uh firing on all cylinders now so uh <laughs> yeah i mean not to want to draw the ire of the viewers but spend a lot of time talking to microsoft these days <laughs> <laughs> oh man and um, we're really on a roll here <laughs> they're uh, they're a lovely bunch of people and i thoroughly enjoy working with my my counterparts in microsoft um uh they're very accommodating they're uh, talented engineers and um i think it's safe to believe the hype you know microsoft i i i'm getting a bit bored of the uh, Microsoft hearts Linux and you know it's a meme that's now overspilled to you know asterisk hearts Linux you know right. th there's a lot of that going around but if we just cut through the meme um, they are serious about bringing their products and services to Linux with feature parity um, and I'm very much enjoying being on that journey um, you know this is a pivot it's been a pivotal period for Microsoft and it's been fascinating to have the privilege to see at a real sort of engineering level and and contributed to some of what they've been doing in order to bring their stuff to Linux. And I can tell you now, they're not, they're not done yet. There's so much stuff in the pipeline. It's fantastic. Well, that's awesome to hear. I mean, and I think that most people aren't against that whole scenario. They would love to see that happen. It's just, you're right. You got to break through that meme and, mm. you know, it's, it's, there's such that big fear looming that people have of, well, they're just trying to get in with our graces so that they can, you know, destroy Linux. And I, you know, yeah. obviously that to me is way overblown. Yeah. Uh, so you'll hear, you'll see and hear people talk about, you know, embrace, extend, extinguish, which right. was a Microsoft stance from some time ago a lot of the people that talk about embrace extend extinguish weren't born when that was a thing you know that's how long ago it was um and i lived through it right i worked with microsoft products and i could see what was going on i was it was patently obvious some of the dirty tricks microsoft played certainly in the ms dos days where they were deliberately at you know making 
it impossible for some software vendors to get their applications to run on Microsoft DOS. You know, that it was real dirty, you know, hostile tactics. But that is not the Microsoft that we have today. I think there is definitely room for improvement on Windows in its stance around, you know, data collection and privacy and all the rest of it. So I'm not giving them a free pass on everything. But in terms of, you know, Microsoft have consistently pumped out good quality software, Windows aside, because I, you know, there was a reason why I was looking to use Linux all those years ago. Um, you know, Windows didn't do it for me. It doesn't do it for me today. Um as evidenced by I have a Mac now and I've switched over everything I used to do on that one Windows machine to Mac OS. Um, but they're a very different organization. They've got lots of quality software. They've got talented people and they've got lots of momentum. So it's great. And I am, as I've just explained, I'm 1990s Linux guy. You know, if there's if there is anyone out there that should still harbor grudges to towards Microsoft, it's people of my generation who lived through that. And what I find fascinating is almost exclusively, it's people of my generation that did live through that, that are accepting of you know Microsoft into the open source community. Um, and there's a lot of people that are parroting rhetoric from you know other people um, and not really understanding the nuance and the, and the history. You know, it's just... Uh, oh, uh, if I'm a badge wearing Linux enthusiast, you know, I have to, um, you know, trash talk Microsoft. Uh, right. And you don't have to. It's fine. It's okay to like Microsoft. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's uh, it. Everyone, everyone's hit down. Uh, hit, oh, my. Hit this like now, right? We've, uh, we've, we've installed the virtues of Mac OS and we've, we've given thumbs up to, to, to Windows. So, uh, they've all hit dislike and they've probably stopped watching. So throw out this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, look, I asked Popey the same question, but I want your take on it. Mm -hmm. um, you work for Canonical, obviously, so people are pretty receptive to Linux there. You know, mm. when when you're working for the day. Um, yep. But what about the people that you meet outside of work? Uh, friends, family. Just people, like I said, people you meet. Do you find okay. those people are receptive to Linux? Um, other than my immediate family, who I've obviously moved to Linux some years ago, none of my friends that, that, that are outside Canonical have an inkling what Linux is or what Ubuntu is. But then again, they barely understand what Windows and Mac OS is, right? This, 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 there's, a, there's a distinction here. They're interested in football and Formula One and rugby, and they are interested in the largest uh, high-resolution uh, TV that they can buy, and they're interested in uh, what the best streaming services are, and they're interested in what the best set-top boxes are. And they're interested in games consoles. So they have an interest in technology, but that services their mostly leisure pursuits. When they're not using computer for computers for entertainment at home, a computer is a tool that they use at work. And they broadly associate computers with work, and therefore computers are boring. Um, and, you know, they just don't understand why, why I'm so fascinated <laughs> by it all. And um, they don't understand that, you know, I work on this thing called Linux and they get their laptop out and explain they've got this problem. And I'm like, I can't, I actually can't help you anymore. <laughs> you know, maybe 15 years ago, I would have known enough about Windows or Mac OS. I mean, I'm kind of being a bit facetious. If I really wanted to help them, I could. The fact is, I don't want to. You know, it's like I don't want to spend my evening poking around on a Windows computer to fix it anymore. You know, those those, those days are gone for me. Yeah. Um, so I I kind of play uh, play a bit dumb and say, well, you know, I don't I don't do Windows. I really can't help you. Um, if I worked for Microsoft, I still don't think they'd be interested. You know, the computers are boring for them unless right. unless it's playing Netflix or. Um, they're using it to play a game. Um, computers are not not something they're interested in. They'd far rather have beer. You know, we talk about 
our kids and what our kids have been up to. We talk about, you know, whatever's going on in the sports world, which is a conversation I can't hold anymore because I just, I just don't follow uh, sports closely at all these days. So I'm, I, I go a bit deaf and dumb when we have that conversation because I've got nothing to contribute. Um, and we talk about how good the food is in the pub and, you know, maybe we get round to oh i've just recently bought a new roku you know one of them's bought a roku or an apple tv and at that point then i can contribute to the conversation (laughs) and we can have a conversation about technology um but that's sort of the extent of it i think that is more of a accurate statement or more of an accurate position of what people are uh looking at today and i have the same basic experiences where you know, people don't even they don't even want to talk about computers they mm-hmm. just want to talk about everyday normal stuff so yeah but that is everyday normal stuff for me so <laughs> yeah now this this position changes completely when we go to um you know open source and linux conferences and when we go and train you know potential customers or clients or whatever and you have a room full of developers they're all interested in computers. And on those occasions, you start to strike up friendships with some of those people and those conversations are very familiar to the, the, the sort of conversation we're having now. Everyone, everyone knows this stuff. Or if they don't know, if they don't know a particular thing, they're interested in finding out. Right. Um, so yeah. But they don't look at you strange. No, no, quite no. My my friends are just you know they've got no they've got no appreciation for you know what 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 Linux is. They you know it's not interesting. Well, let's jump into uh, podcast for a while. Okay. So you joined the Ubuntu podcast in 2015. I think you're right. I was a bit shocked when I saw that earlier. <laughs> yeah, it's that's that's gone quite quickly. Yep. And this is a podcast that is on my Pocket Cast top list of ones to listen to as soon as it comes out. Uh, I Thank love the much. fact. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm not saying that because I'm talking to you. I, I mean, I really love the, the show itself and how you bring that personal touch to the show where it's not just a podcast. It's Martin mm-hmm. talking to Alan and Alan talking to Mark and yeah. um, what you've been up to. And so what is it about the Ubuntu podcast that it's lasted so long? Well, I can't speak to the first eight years because I wasn't involved. <laughs> you know, Popey has the answer for its longevity, I suppose, because he's uh, the only presenter that's been there the whole eight years. But I've listened to the Ubuntu podcast since the beginning. And uh, I've always liked the fact that it was basically a group of friends having a chat. And, you know, like we were just talking about, you know, when I go down the pub, the, the conversation is not the things that I would like to be talking about. But when we do the podcast and the Ubuntu podcast over the years, it's a group of people who are drawn together through a common interest and they're just having a conversation. And yeah. I think that style um is a successful recipe um and certainly it makes it easy to record because we don't have to spend a lot of time in fact we don't spend much time at all (laughs) truth be told (laughs) preparing show notes we literally have um bullet points and who is going to introduce each topic and then we just have a chat um so i suppose one of the reasons it has lasted is we've worked hard to make it easy to reproduce and uh, uh, be as low effort as possible so you know you don't get fatigued by the oh gosh you know i've got to spend an hour doing this and two hours doing that we've tried to you know make it as efficient as possible we've even written our own software to handle the post-production and publishing pipeline and stuff like that Wow, um, to, I need that. <laughs> uh, it's on it's on the Ubuntu podcast Git, GitHub page, and it's called Pod Published. It's uh, yeah, it's a cool bit of software. I'm quite proud of that. Um, so yeah, it's I really enjoy doing it because um, every Tuesday night, um, me and my mates get to hang out a bit like this. Um, we we spend you know an hour and a half having a chat about the thing that we like chatting about, and yeah, we share that with people and. 
I've always liked the podcasts where the presenters share a bit of themselves because um, as a podcast listener myself, I like to have a connection with the people that I'm listening to. And as a podcast listener, you get to feel like those presenters are friends of yours, even though you've never met and they don't know that you're listening. You feel like you're connected to them in some way and and you know things about them. And um, I think that those little um, segments about, you know, what we've been up to are definitely, they're, they're a mechanic that uh, Alan created and it was really designed so that each of the voices would present themselves and explain who they were to allow people to listen and say, oh, this is Alan and this is Mark this is Martin and this is Laura, and actually make the connections to the voices before you start talking about the other stuff. So it was really a mechanic for getting familiar with what the, who the voices were, um, but it serves uh, a, a more important uh, process in my mind, which is um, it actually um, brings people to the podcast and keeps them coming back each week to listen because they like hearing those little anecdotes and silly stuff that we get up to. That is so true, though, because you when you first start listening to a podcast, you're not going to be able to tell the difference between who is who. Right. Um, and then after listening for a while, you do get to know their voices. And even after that, you do get that connection where you mm -hmm. think, you know, not that you think, but that you feel like you're a friend of that person and they don't even know you exist. Yeah. But then again, you know, we go to Og Camp and UbuCon and Foss Talk Live and Linux West Northwest. And those people who have come to know who you are will come and introduce yourselves and you can have a, introduce themselves to you and you can have a very natural conversation because you hit the ground running with, you know, a very natural conversation. And it is like meeting of even if I've not met that person before, you have a, an immediate rapport because they know who you are and what you're about and how to approach you. It's, it's pretty great. Yep. Uh, you also have been a longstanding guest on Linux Unplugged. Uh, yeah. That is also on the top of my uh, pocket cast to listen to. Mine too. Chris has done a fantastic job with Jupiter Broadcasting over the years. Uh, what made you get involved with... Um, Linux Unplugged from being just a regular user? Uh, mostly because I'd been listening to that since day one, and then Popey started going on it, and I hadn't seen Popey in donkey's years, and Popey was wrong every week, and I couldn't tolerate it anymore, so I had to join. <laughs> <laughs> I saw you drinking your coffee. Oh, I couldn't resist. <laughs> Almost spit it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, really, really to make sure Popey wasn't making it up as he was going along. Um, <laughs> no, it, wa it wasn't quite like that, but it, it was, it was, it was like, huh, here, here's a familiar voice, somebody that I, I used to know at the, the lug, so I've not seen in ages. So uh, I thought, well, I could, I could do that. You know, I could, I could turn up and, and talk about things that I know about. Um, but I listened for about six months and hadn't done anything about it. And then the job that I was in at the time, I was finding quite stressful and I, I was trying to think of ways that I could keep hold of my Linux skills at, and move into a different sort of role within, you know, the Linux world. Um, and so I sort of set myself this goal of in two years, I either wanted to be working for the Raspberry Pi Foundation or Canonical. That was my objective. So part of going on Linux Unplugged was to uh, raise my profile uh, so that people knew who I was um, so that I could pursue that goal. And part of it was uh, I was working on the Mate desktop at that time and it wasn't well rep it wasn't represented at all. And, uh, you know, I wanted to share what that team were, were doing. So it was, I was, I, I, I was referred to by some people at the time as uh, the poor man's John O. Bacon. Uh, you know, <laughs> I, was trying, I was trying to be a community manager for Marte Desktop without actually knowing what a community manager was. Um, so it was a couple of things. But, yeah, it was partly 
profile building, partly raising the profile of Mate Desktop, partly reconnecting with people who I'd lost touch with, in this case, Alan, um, and also finding something a bit like a lug that had evaporated in the area that I live in, and it was the closest thing that uh, could be a lug, and I didn't have to get in the car and, and drive for an hour. So yep. it was a combination of things. Well, on Linux Unplugged, uh, you've talked many times about you know what you're into, Raspberry Pis, small form computers like GPDs. Um, is there something that is really exciting to you right now? Maybe some new hardware? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> these things. I've become somewhat addicted to these. So I'll show you the first one I got. So this is um, a single, single lane PCI uh, board. And right. it has two uh, SATA two and a half inch SSDs on it. And you plug that into the desktop here, and that's two bootable drives or something that you can raid with um, software raid on Linux or you can use on ZFS. And it doesn't require any power cables or anything, right? You just plug it in, it gets all of the power and connectivity it needs off that connector there. So it's a really tidy wow. way to add storage to a desktop computer without a load of cable mess, right? And it's not about creating high speed storage. It's about uh, trying to create um, solid state storage inexpensively. So these, these are one terabyte um, SSDs and they're currently on Black Friday uh, deal and they're 80 pounds each. And I think this board was 20 quid. So that's two terabyte of solid state storage for um, a touch under 200 pounds, which is pretty good, pretty good going. And then, then I found out the same organization <laughs> make <laughs> this one, which uh, has got the same connector, but now it's got discs both sides. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so this is four terabytes of solid state storage. Um, and again, you don't need any additional power. So I, I now, uh, these, these are out because I've just been upgrading the discs. And then I discovered, and it gets better, <laughs> there's this one, which has got a four-lane uh, PCI connector, and it takes four M.2 SSDs, as that you can see, nice. unpopulated. Um, so uh, I'm going to be filling that one up um, over probably the next four or five months, but I'm going to put four two-terabyte SSDs in that to create an eight-terabyte chunk of storage. So have you tested the, I mean, I know it's slower, but have you tested the real-time performance of those drives? Yeah, when you're accessing them as single drives, let's imagine you want to use one as a bit. So I'm using these for two things. One, I'm using as a backup target. So I do a regular snapshot of my home directory. So if I make a catastrophic mistake, I've got a restore point. And the other is to add disks that I can boot off. So I have a multi-boot system. And instead of partitioning up like one disk to boot multiple Linux distros, I have a distro on each, on each drive. And um, they're SATA, the, 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 the large cards I've shown you are SATA disks, and you get what you would recognize as traditional SATA performance. So, you know, 500 megabits a second, something like that. Right. Um, but yeah, they perform great. Um, and it's a nice way to add more storage to the, your system without lots of cables. And I, I'm just really taken with them. I can't stop buying the damn things though. So I'm going to, have to put those back. well, I would definitely be, you know, I have so many drives laying around and in other computers, that would be a good way to utilize them without having like, uh, you know, yeah. 10 more SATA cables in there. So that's like new hardware. Or well, not new hardware. I mean, I, I imagine those devices have been around for a few years. That I've only recently discovered them this year, and I just love the concept. Um, but the other thing that I'm playing with at the moment, which again, none of this is new, but it's new to me. Yep. So my desk side machine that I have next to me here, um, I built earlier in the year, and it had um I had a 1080 Ti from uh, uh, my previous build, which I had in a GPU enclosure that was my graphics card. And then at some point 
after I built this, I got a 2080 Ti, and the 2080 Ti is in there, and that's my main thing. Um, my daughter's recently started uh, playing computer games, what we'd recognize as proper computer games. Um, you know, she's been playing emulators and stuff like that since she was quite young. Uh, but she now plays Lego Worlds, which is available on Steam and works under Proton. Um, and I've been doing that through the NVIDIA Shield, but it's a bit of a faff to set up each time. You always have to log into Steam every time you start it, which is, you know, a bit slow. And sometimes the servers are, um, are fully occupied, so you, you might have to wait 10 minutes before, you know, a slot becomes available and you, you can start playing the game. So um, I've got a Steam link, which is downstairs in the front room, and there's a couple of Steam controllers down there. And what I've done is I've put the uh, 1080 Ti back in the system as well. So I've got a 2080 Ti and a 1080 Ti in, in this machine. And I have Steam installed in a LexD container on this machine with the 1080 Ti allocated as the GPU. So that is my daughter's Steam box. So when she wants to play her game now, I just launch the container and it has a dedicated GPU and she goes downstairs, turns on the Steam link that connects to her Steam box and she plays her games and it streams from, from this box on a dedicated GPU. And I've uh, set up some processor affinity so she gets four cores off my CPU to power that. And I'm largely unaffected because I've got a 2080 Ti for me and another another four cores of, of CPU for whatever I'm working on. And it's the ultimate parental control because I have the kill switch <laughs> on, on, the, on the container. <laughs> so that's something I've been uh, setting up over the course of the last few weeks and it's been a lot of fun uh, to do. Very nice. Well, I mean, you had said something about uh, getting a Elgato stream yes. deck. Uh, yeah, I'm playing with that. That's here. There we go. That's partly configured at the moment. Now, that wasn't um, available as far as software for Linux. Is that now supported or what? It is. Yeah. So I've configured that entirely using Linux. It's not as featureful as. Uh, so I've installed the the drivers on mac os to compare mm -hmm. um on mac os it's sort of um driven by applications so you say i want to add some twitch functionality to a button and it has a whole section of twitch and you just drag you know a particular twitch feature to a button and it does it all for you on linux you have um each button and it basically says what you want to call it what graphic do you want to put on it do you want to send a key press do you want to do a page switch do you want to write some text out you know there's a whole bunch of options and you configure each button discreetly uh, but you can do anything you like with it effectively um, and the way i intend to use this is when i'm doing those video conferences at work i quite often have to mute the microphone or mute the camera or whatever so I'm, i've got camera mute and camera and mic and camera mute on those the hang up button so at the end of the thing i can push a button and hang the call up and then when we record the podcast we have a couple of applications that we have running in order to converse with one another and record the local audio and what have you so i've got another page which has got all of those buttons so instead of having to go to each application and dip, 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 i can just push some buttons and it's all done so I could configure that to switch scenes in OBS? And stuff yeah, like that. yeah. You know, it, it work, works particularly well with OBS. Very nice. Uh, I might be looking it's, into that myself. <laughs> it's not perfect. You know, the, the software that's available for Linux is functional, but there are some minor caveats that need, you know, refinement, but you can configure it and... If the issues are so tight, sometimes you'll press a button and it will steal focus away to the application away from the thing you want to control. And you have to like switch focus back. But other than that, it's pretty good. So it's, get, it's definitely getting there and it, you can definitely set one up. Well, somehow you're going to have to keep us updated on it because I really want to yeah. see how it continually performs. Yeah, I'm, I'm 
committed to get, getting it better configured because I'm working on a little project where I, I need to do some stuff with OBS. So I will be uh, configuring it to do some OBS stuff as well. Hmm, hidden gem in there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can't say any more, but yeah, working on a thing. Doing a thing. Doing a thing. All right. Um, you look, you do a lot of volunteer work in your free time. Uh, mm. You have done, uh, you've been community manager, developer, release engineer, Debian maintainer, uh, Google Summer of Code mentor, uh, podcaster, presenter. These are all things that you've done going through the years. Um, it's a awesome effort on your part to give of yourself all of that time because all of that, I mean, you're not getting paid for that. Mm -hmm. Um, is there one of those things that you can pick out of all of that community work that was the most rewarding for you? Oh, wow. Well, there's different kinds of personal reward. So as I explained, some of that podcasting stuff that I, I guess got involved in, there was a personal agenda there to raise my profile because I wanted to have a switch of careers and, and do something that I was passionate about. So that was personally rewarding because it utterly facilitated that happening and also set me on the path to where I am today, where I am now very proud to be representing the Ubuntu desktop team. You know, I'm back back on the Ubuntu desktop team where I started at Canonical and I, 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 I can't tell you how delighted I am to be back, back there doing that. So, you know, all of that work in the podcasts over the years helped me achieve that goal. So personally, very rewarding for myself. So it's not all, you know, philanthropic in that sense. A um, couple of things that we've done a few times. I've done this through the Mate desktop. I've done it with Canonical uh, for the Summer of Code and also Google Code in. Um, I find mentoring students. So Code in is uh, students that are aged between 13 and 17. I think we've done that twice at Canonical. And Google Summer of Code is um, university age students. And mentoring students and helping bring through what are what could be the next generation of open source and free software contributors is is very rewarding. It's exhausting. Uh, uh, it's probably the most time consuming thing you can do, particularly the Google coding stuff. My goodness, the the volume of students and their appetite to do stuff is just voracious, and it, it, it it's a month over the Christmas period as well. So it's a month of daily, just high volume stuff, but it's brilliant. Um, amazing how many uh, talented young people there are all around the world. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a delight to ha have some hand in maybe their, you know, um, introduction to the open source world. Um, so those those are definitely high points for me. Yep, definitely uh, rewarding. Definitely yes. rewarding. A different kind of rewarding, but yeah, very much. Yep. Well, I think most people will have heard the story of you starting Ubuntu Mate with Alan Pope. Um, um, everyone on the planet has heard that story by now. I think. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> so, but how does it grow becoming an Ubuntu flavor? and gaining this huge fan base. Um, and I guess basically what I'm asking is, it was a passion project then. Mm -hmm. Is it still a passion project now? Yes, it is. Yeah. Uh, it's still my, it's still where I spend the vast majority of my free time um, is working on Ubuntu Mate. And that will either be as a package maintainer for Mate desktop in Debian, uh, because probably the lion's share of what I do is actually within the Debian project rather than in Ubuntu directly. Um, and I still think of it as a personal interest project. Predominantly, it started out focused on my family, and then it was like, well, 
my family are happy with this, but I'm not. So in recent years, it, I've tried to make <laughs> Ubuntu Mate a thing that I'm happy with, that I, I am happy to use every day. And here I am using it right now, and I'm very happy with Ubuntu Mate 1910. Delighted, in fact. Um, and it's a very useful, um, it's a very useful pastime because it's, well, apart from anything, it, it got me hired at Canonical in the first instance, <laughs> uh, because, you know, I was able to demonstrate that I knew what it took to, you know, put together a desktop distribution and it keeps my hand in with a number of skills and it exposes me to new stuff, you know. I recently did some work on GPU switching in Ubuntu Mate, and that caused me to learn about new features in the, the current generation of the NVIDIA drivers. So, you know, it, it helps me scratch an itch and learn new things and keep my skills current. Um, and I think that's going to be useful now. Now I'm representing the Ubuntu desktop team again, and I have such, uh, such a uh, a, a, a good group of talented engineers that work on the Ubuntu desktop. It's good that I know something about what it is they do on a day-to-day -day basis. <laughs> yes, <laughs> definitely a good thing. Uh, well, you said you met, you just released the Ubuntu Mate 1910. Um, and for everything that I have seen, it's been a super successful release. But you described it as a paper cut release. Mm -hmm. Um can you tell us about what your favorite things are about 1910? Um, the fact that it just works now. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it's... sometimes that's an overused statement by some people, but right. that is a, such an important thing. <laughs> I mean, literally yeah. an important thing. It, it's difficult. So... If there was a single feature that I'm most pleased with, then it is the uh, notifications indicator and the do not disturb capability and the fact you can whitelist and blacklist what no what things can present notifications. That has been something I've wanted for ages and makes my life so much easier now. So when I was... Um, on stage at UbuCon, I was able to hit the do not disturb. And on this occasion, nobody saw the telegram notifications from my mum whilst I was presenting. <laughs> when in the past, everyone would have seen every single one of those until I, you know, uh, went in there and closed down telegram. So I love that feature. It's, it's a simple thing, but it's very useful. Uh, all of the other things that we did were it, it, are all a whole thing together it was all just making it better fixing things and making it better um you know i'm obviously aware where the rough edges are you know you can't create a thing and be blind to where the deficiencies are but you can't solve it all all at once right or at least you can't with a you know a small team of people you could if you had you know a thousand engineers like google can throw throw around between projects you could fix a lot of stuff really quickly um so you have to prioritize and it was all just a bit crufty and broken in lots of different little places and now it isn't and it's not perfect but now it's just so much better and i'm not triggered by you know the high dpi not being right the menu not working correctly the indicators not uh, uh, being the correct side there's just so many things and i'm just yeah, pleased. And I, I think that for Ubuntu Mate, I'm going to probably carry that that idea forward now and just treat every release as um, improving the quality because you can deliver new features through addressing, um, you know, paper cuts. There were lots of new features in 1910, but they were all to address, you know, long-standing issues. So I think I'm going to just adopt that as the way that we do things now, just focus on the quality. I realize now that I, it doesn't matter how hard I work on it in my spare time, it will never get to where I want it to be uh, at, at the speed I want it to get there. So I'm just going to have to be okay with that and just get into it's just an iterative, slow, uh, uh, qualitative improvement with new features coming along uh, at some point. Uh, I've tried the sprint there and 
that there's just not enough people involved to really get it where it needs to be. Yep. Slow, slow, gentle, continuous improvement from this point forwards, I think. Yep. Well, you've, again, we talked about it, but you recently moved into this Ubuntu desktop lead. And yep. it's a great position for you to be in. Um, I don't think Will Cook got enough credit for all of the things he led the desktop team through. Mm -hmm. um, and I do want to thank him for that and wish him well. But um, I think you are able to fill that void, uh, very capable of filling that void, I should say. So what is the short-term and long-term goals in your mind for the desktop team? So um, the Ubuntu desktop uh, since 1804 has had three cycles of development and there have been new features and things being worked on there. Um, this, is, this is a daunting time to take on the Ubuntu desktop because, as you point out, Will has done a very good job for the last five years and hasn't dropped the ball in any of those releases and i'm coming into this with the next release being an lts quite possibly the most significant lts to date so uh, i don't want to mess that up and uh, i don't think that's possible because of the great team that work on the ubuntu desktop so you know they're a safe pair of hands so this is a fairly low risk cycle. It's basically bringing to conclusion all of the things we've been working on over the last 18 months. So, you know, a standout feature for 1910 was the um, ZFS uh, integration that uh, Didier and Jean-Baptiste have been working on. And I only spoke to them yesterday and, you know, they're very close to, to concluding that work it, even in these very early days of 2004 um and yeah. i think that's going to be you know a terrific feature for a, an lts that's going to be around for years and years um and you know daniel van vogt has been widely celebrated for uh, all of the work that he's done in upstream gnome to address you know what you could broadly describe as paper cuts as well you know lots of little niggly issues that together you know ruin what otherwise would be a really you know wonderful experience um so he's going to be doing more of the same for this cycle you know more performance and stability fixes um you'd be amazed um at how much energy and effort is involved by the desktop team just to maintain the quality from going from gnome uh 3.34 to 3.36 um there are 14 people on the desktop team at canonical and we estimate that probably um 70 of their collective time in a in a cycle is bringing in that new version of gnome making sure all of the tests pass uh bringing in the new libraries that are required by you know that uplifting gnome which in you know within ubuntu everything that we ship by default has to be in the main repository so all of that is subject to security review so our security team have to inspect literally every line of new code or if it's a new library every line of code in that library in order to determine if it if it's something they can support from a security point of view so there's a whole bunch of work that goes on there um and what's interesting about this is doing feature work on top there's there's not a lot of time for you know um headline features but we've you know we've delivered a few and we've got a few more lined up for this cycle as well that i think people will find interesting but actually making that sort of solid reliable thing is all of this work that goes into it and that's where there's the benefit for the, the official flavors because there's so much work being done by the kernel team, by the foundations team, and by the desktop team, that you only really have to, you know, as Ubuntu Mate, I only have to worry about like the last 5% because I get all of that other engineering free. So I yep. get, I don't know, there's probably 50 engineers involved in, in that chain up to where I got to here. And then that enables a small team of a handful of people to, act as an extension of all of that engineering 
um, and benefit from it. You know, it might be that, you know, um, Zubuntu, Lubuntu, Ubuntu Mate, Budgie, we've all got a different um, outlook on what uh, the Linux desktop should look like. But we can have that difference of opinion, but all work together collaboratively on the whole thing. And that's yep. rather wonderful. But all of that work that all of those people do at Canonical, and in particular on the desktop team, is also what Linux Mint and Zorin and Elementary and System76 all get for free that enable them to focus on the last 5% as well with small teams of people. So, you know, it's a, it's a huge, it's a huge, a huge effort for us and maintaining the security of all of that stuff yep. that then all of these other communities get to build on and benefit from and innovate in their own ways. Well, sometimes I think we take that for granted. Um, I think everyone of... takes it for granted. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 you'll be astonished at the work that's involved. It's, you know, um, when you consider every line of code in the main repository has been eyeballed by somebody in the security team to ensure that it is well written maintained has upstream um activity can be patched you know the upstream it has um a robust um security uh reporting mechanism so that you know things can be patched when cva cves are identified there's just a huge amount of effort that goes into all of that and it's um it's it's like dial tone it's like picking up the telephone and you hear boo at the end of the phone yeah. you know you could take it for granted that you know that those ubuntu foundations are solid and reliable because of all the work that those people do well it, it's funny because there are a lot of people that like to put out hate towards canonical because they're the company um and i posed the question one time and, you know, you don't get many responses, but I posed the question, if what happens, what would happen to Linux desktop itself if one day Canonical wasn't there? Boom. Just one day you woke up and Canonical's no longer there. Yes, there would be communities that would pick up certain things, but mm -hmm. would Linux survive if that happened? Oh, yeah, definitely. I think Linux desktop would survive. I think it would be a very different landscape. Just look at all of those... Look at all of those distributions that are proving to be popular that are derived from Ubuntu. They would all have to rebase on something else, or they would have to do what Canonical do, which is operate as a downstream of Debian and build from source the entirety of the Debian archive, you know, so that they have that, that commons of software ava available in order to make their distribution. But without or, the resources... I mean, I don't even right, think they I've could do that. I just explained that in order to do that, you need at least this engineering <laughs> engineering teams that are probably between 50 and 100 engineers. So the, really the only practical way they could do that is to base off of Debian and capitalize on all of the contributors and volunteers in the Debian project, which is also sizable, um, and, and tee off from there. But then, you know, pe people... People rather naively assume that Ubuntu is just Debian, and there are significant differences in in a number of ways between uh, not just in terms of the packages and the versions of packages and the libraries, but fundamentally how things are optimized and tuned for security, for example. Um, so they would have, to, yeah, if Ubuntu just wasn't there, Linux Mint elementary zorin system 76 those are probably the big four all of the ubuntu flavors they would all all have to find another way to present themselves it would it would it would leave a sizable crater on the planet of desktop linux i think yep well looking at your ubuntu wiki um there's a section for future goals mm-hmm so it includes help organize a community event, mm -hmm. perhaps an UbuCon. So mm -hmm. I know you, we talked about oh, your talk. Don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, go on, carry on. Uh, were you involved in organizing in any way? Um, no, not really. Um, so I've been to all of the European UbuCons, and I think I've presented at all of them, um, more than one talk at each, I think. 
this last one because of my involvement at Canonical and I'm one of, in fact, it's Alan and I, um, who sort of um, gatekeep the Ubuntu Community Fund. So you know when you go in and you download Ubuntu and it says, do you want to contribute some money to Ubuntu? And there's sliders for different areas. One of those sliders is community. So if you move that slider around and you contribute some money, that goes into a pot. And Alan and I get to see what that pot of money is. And then Ubuntu members, so people who have demonstrated a sustained commitment to the Ubuntu project, they apply to be a member. And if they're successful in their application, one of the perks is they can apply for funds from that pot of money to host events or maybe cover their travel expenses to go to another conference where they want to present. You know, there's a whole bunch of ways that that money can be used, but it's mostly around attending conferences as a speaker or hosting conferences or hosting community events. So this year, I was the, uh, the contact that the UbuCon organizers had with Canonical in order to sort out swag and, you know, uh, funding for their event. Um, and that was really a couple of telegram messages a week with Tiago, you know, it wasn't. We can, we can check that box though. You helped organize. <laughs> no, not really. Not in the sense. So what's awkward is the last three Ubu cons, the event finishes and then Popey and I get pigeonholed by uh, all, the, all the usual movers and shakers in the Ubuntu community in Europe. And they say to us, it's the UK next time you two need to host one in the, <laughs> in the UK. Um, and, that's that's challenging as you've pointed out don't have much spare time i know i know i know what the effort involved in hosting an ubu con is and i can't i can't square that you know there are not enough hours in the day uh for me to do that but maybe there's an ubuntu member in the uk listening to this thinking oh that's a way i can contribute there you go well i know you've been to a million conferences and you know, it's probably not a question you can answer, but do you have a favorite conference? Um, I have some favorite conferences. I think I do actually have a favorite, but I don't want to play favorites, but I'm going to in a bit. Um, <laughs> so uh, I really enjoy UbuCon, as we've just described. I have a lot of great friends across Europe who are in the, Ubuntu community and through UbuCon, I get to see those people about every year to 18 months. And um, the social aspect of UbuCon is fabulous and I absolutely love it. So, as much as I enjoy going along and listening to all the great things that people in the community are doing with and around Ubuntu, um, you know, having a drink in a bar, going out for a meal, having chats in the, uh, I just love that. It's just, it's just lovely. It's it's being with your your own tribe and your people, and it's a very comfortable place to be. Similarly, in recent years, I've got to go to Linux Fest Northwest a couple of times, and that has enabled me to meet another group of people that I have interacted with via the internet, like um, Chris Fisher, for example, who I never met. And it's great to be able to meet these people that you've known for years but never yep. met. But then more importantly, a community of people that are in that part of the world who I would never have got to meet, you know, because I'm in England and they're on the West coast of America. So that's been great to establish friendships with people, you know, from that community, from that geography. So I love going to Linux Fest Northwest for that. And I was looking at the event calendar and I know I can't make Linux Fest Northwest um, in 2020 and I'm absolutely devastated oh, that I'm not going to be there. So maybe I'll have to go to one of the other uh, North maybe American. Self. Yeah, maybe, maybe we'll have to do that because um, yeah, I do enjoy, do enjoy uh, going to different parts of the world to community events. Um, and then of course there's Og Camp, which we've had quite recently. That was um, a few weeks ago. Um, and a lot like UbuCon, it's a slightly different group of friends, mostly from the UK, although there are a number of people that travel from uh, Europe. And even there were some people that I met at Linux Fest Northwest this year who were at OGCamp in the UK 
who traveled all the way from uh from the states to come to Wog camp so that's wow. you know pretty impressive to see yep um and that's the same thing you're amongst your tribe your people a lot of friends that you already know and the opportunity to make new friends and i suppose that's one of the things i really enjoy about those events um you get to see your old friends and make new friends and then next year when you go back your group of old friends is larger because <laughs> of the, <laughs> the you know, you know the, the times you've been before but it pains me to say it i'm, I'm about to give joe ressington a compliment oh no um, <laughs> probably my favorite linuxy event in the annual calendar is foss talk live which is the smallest by far um and that is an evening of the the uk podcasters basically get together and we each do our dog and pony show for 45 minutes each over the course of a late afternoon and evening in a pub in london so this pub has a cellar which is where the stage is and it seats about 50 to 60 people uh, the pub has an array of excellent beers, and it also has excellent pub grub. And we just take the whole place over. And it's all my mates from the Linux community in the UK, by and large. You know, there are obviously people I don't know. Uh, and it's just a lovely afternoon. It's usually in the summer, so the weather's decent. We sit outside, drink some beer, and have a chat. And then we each do a version of our podcast uh, recorded live in front of an actual audience, which is um, uh, fabulous and intimidating in equal measure. <laughs> <laughs> but I love that event. Um, I, I, I love that the Ubuntu podcast tries to be creative and treat that like a live show. So the podcasts that we record there are quite unlike the podcasts that you hear, you know, each week. Um, and we spend well this time we spent six months preparing for that show uh for yes. that 45 minute segment and you know what i loved every minute of that preparation building up to it and i i loved um doing that show and i love watching everyone else's show including the linux lads who made their debut appearance at the event this year and catching up with everybody you know it's a great you know 45 minutes 15 minutes to go and have a chat and then there's an hour break in the middle it just i just love it I, yeah i just really enjoy that and then the pub closes and we all bundle out and we go to another pub across the street that's open until the early hours of the morning and the party continues over there it's just it's just it, everything that you can think about the social track of every conference you go to condensed down into one afternoon and evening into the early hours and i i just really like that event. Well, that has to be a packed event. I mean, you said it seats, what, 50 or 60 people in that yeah. cellar. I mean, there's got to be people that go that don't even get down there. No. So Joe uh, manages the ticket allocation. So there is precisely the right amount of people to, to get into the, the, you know, the stage. Um, <laughs> and But uh, uh, above and beyond that, anyone can come. And as people come and go, because some people don't watch all of the podcasts, is that if there's space, it's it, they're not paid tickets it's just tickets to sort of control uh the number of people that come right but joe manages that really well so it's it's rammed you know when you go into this tiny little room and it is tiny um uh when i say it's 50 to 60 people it's there is no dead space it is 50 60 people rammed in there you know <laughs> sat in rows of seats and standing room at the back and just wedged in every every available space thankfully the air conditioning in there is excellent <laughs> otherwise it would be <laughs> deeply uncomfortable you know and i say stage it's i don't know two feet deep and uh, eight feet across it's tight it's tiny little venue but that's what makes it so great yeah. because even when you're presenting your you know your show in air quotes um you can see everybody and you know you feel very close you don't feel separate from them you're you're right sat there with them maybe bump so, arms with them <laughs> oh yeah i mean it's it's brilliant i i, I really enjoy that event it's, it is my favorite um without a doubt that's awesome um so there were other two other goals on your ubuntu wiki page okay um, one of them was to become a debian developer 
Right. Yes. <laughs> and one of the, the other one was to expand my responsibilities in the Ubuntu community. Yes. I think you have fulfilled that. <laughs> no, I don't think I have actually. Um, so Debian developer is definitely aspirational, uh, but it's something I'd like to achieve. That would be, uh, you know, a bucket list, bucket list item. Um, but expanding my role in the Ubuntu community, uh, I know exactly what I want to do there. I want to become uh, a Mutu, which is uh, a master of the universe. So the universe archive in Ubuntu is where the majority of the community maintained work is. So all of the flavors, their packages are in universe. And a lot of the thing, well, everything that's not shipped by Ubuntu by default is in universe. So FFmpeg is in universe. Um, uh, Gnome MPV celluloid is, is there. So is VLC. So there's lots of high profile software there. And I would like to, I was very fortunate that all of the people at Canonical who put up with my pestering when I was trying to bootstrap Ubuntu Mate that helped me achieve that. And I haven't paid down that debt yet. So I want to become a Mutu so I can A, help the existing flavors with some of their package maintenance and new packages coming in as their projects develop because there is not enough people available to do that and there are a couple of um a, a ubuntu derivatives that are bootstrapping that are that want to become official flavors and i would like to help them join the ubuntu family so i want to apply to be a mutu so i can help those people achieve their goals in the same way other people at Canonical in the past helped me achieve mine. Very nice. Very nice. Well, over the years, what is, what do you think is the biggest issue or the biggest problem that you have had to overcome uh, during your career, whether, you know, development or whatever, and maybe how exciting it was to actually do it? Oh, goodness. Well, I, I suppose really the most significant thing it is Ubuntu Mate. That, that was pivotal to me achieving my, wide, you know, my broader goals, Pers personal goals, career goals. Um, Ubuntu Mate was at the center of all of that. And without Ubuntu Mate, I wouldn't would wouldn't be in the position that i'm in today so you know that is my uh number one hit single you know my my one hit wonder <laughs> that uh that made it all possible and that has been a succession of challenges and chat and things that i've overcome in order to to get it to where it is and enable me to do the things that i do um, so yeah, it's really that, um, I can't think of anything else that has had so much, you know, um, investment of my time and reward. And also ties back into you wanting to give back. As yes. Well. Yes, totally. I mean, that's that, it, you know, as you've pointed out that that's something that drives me, you know, I, I, my wife, I'm going to say this from my wife's point of view. My wife describes me as a generous person. I like to think I'm a generous person. Um, and I'm generous with my time and with my friends. I'm also generous with the things that I have and the money that I have. You know, I like to, I like to share things. Um, and I suppose that's a quality of, you know, being in and around the free software and open source community for so long. That sort of you know sharing mentality is sort of ingrained in me. So yes, I do like to pay down on the debts um, that I owe, and yeah, there are some projects that I could help achieve their goals, and I want to help them be successful so they can enjoy some of the um, high high points and and uh, and uh, good emotions that I've enjoyed over the years through the work that I've done and others have helped me achieve. 
is that what drives your passion for Linux in general? I mean, there's many reasons people run or use Linux. Um, I like to think, you know, when I originally started, it was, you know, flexibility and customization. I could customize the desktop to what I wanted it to be where I couldn't do that in Windows. Um, I've come to love the Linux community itself. And I think that is the best reason to run Linux. But what is it that drives your passion for Linux? So um, I have had creative outlets in the past. I, I, I used to be something of a musician and, uh, you know, I talked about cooking uh, and I was quite a competent artist when uh, I was going through my education at school. And what I enjoy doing with computers is making stuff. Um, and that for me is a creative endeavor. I like making things and it, it triggers those same feelings about writing a great hook on the guitar or coming up with a great role on the drum. Um, so what Linux and open source means to me is this huge portfolio of software that I, I have at my disposal in order to put it together to make new things or make a thing. It's like having a Lego set with no instructions. You know, you've got all of these pieces and you can put them together and make things. So people talk about, you know, the licenses and the and the freedoms that it offers you, you know, uh, uh, in terms of your, you know, your privacy and the and control. For me, those licenses fuel my, uh, my desire to be creative and to be innovative. And that's what draws me to Linux. There's just all of this stuff and there's all of this potential and possibility. And because of the licenses that it all sits under, it means I can just make anything that I want, given the time uh, of, to do so. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's why I love it. That's the, the key reason for me. Yep. Um, I don't have that creative string in me, so I just got to settle for doing what I can. I, I don't know. I think you're doing yourself a disservice there. I have seen the animations uh, for the bumpers on your YouTube channel. So there's, there's creativity that's gone into that. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> let's move on. I'm just going to dismiss that. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't do that. Um, we used to have a bad reputation around the Linux community in general for not being welcoming, mm -hmm. being unfriendly. Um, it's getting better all the time. But let me ask you, what would you like to see from the community to make things better? Oh, goodness. Right, well, I have an answer for this. Now, and this isn't directed at all of the community. As you say, we're kind of a community of communities. You know, the Ubuntu community is part of the desktop Linux community in the same way that Linux Mint are, in the same way that Elementary are. But not all of those people that operate in those communities necessarily meet all that often. Um, and there are great people in all of these communities, you know, uh, KDE, Ubuntu, you know, you can look anywhere. There are like-minded, smart people who just want to do cool stuff. And they're decent people. And because we're humans, there are people that operate in those communities that are not so nice. And it's those people I would like to talk to. I don't know why it is there is a vocal minority of people that operate within our communities that seem to take some perverse joy in throwing shade and talking down the efforts of what other people are doing. Uh, and it is by far the thing that could turn me away from you know, the desktop Linux community. It absolutely destroys your enthusiasm for, for putting in the amount of effort that you do into something. When somebody from not your community turns up to just tell you your thing is rubbish with no 
critical thought or assessment. They just show up and trash talk it. And I want to see that stop for a number of reasons. I know many people who have just simply stepped away from Linux and contributing to Linux in a meaningful way because that constant undertone from a few people was enough to just throw their hands up and say, I'm sick of this. I, I, I want nothing more to do with it. I'm going to stop making this piece of software. I'm going to stop making this distro, whatever it might be. There are countless example, examples. And is that what these people want? It, 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 you know, are they actively seeking to undermine and, and destroy and disincentivize people from contributing to all of this stuff? So if you see another project doing something unusual, your first response should not be to um, tell them it's rubbish or harsher words. I know, I know you like to keep the language family friendly, so I'm avoiding saying some words here. Thank you. But, yeah, <laughs> but you get the gist. You know, I they're the just gist. they're just mean, rude, uh, unbecoming remarks. What is your motivation? Your there is nothing of value in what you've just done. However, if you look at what they're doing and think to yourself, well, I wonder why they've done that and think about it, maybe go and have a conversation. You know, quite often if you approach, you know, developers and communities that have done a thing and ask them why, they'll explain their rationale. You may not agree with it. That's fine. Then you can have a critical discussion, maybe a technical discussion on the merits of their approach versus what you think. And that's great. I'm all for that. But just this, you know, derogatory uh, talking down and throwing shade on projects, it's just awful. And I, I really want to see that come to an end. It, it makes our wider community um, look toxic. Yep. And I tell you what, when you do go to, you know, I'm privileged, I get to work with the likes of Microsoft, the likes of Google and Amazon and skype and spotify and slack you know all of these big brand you know serious software companies and you know what all of those developers in those organizations see this going on and they want nothing to do with it and they're quite standoffish about it they all have a genuine appreciation for everything that linux and open source brings to the table but they are really um cautious about being sucked into that world where there are these toxic individuals who are just going to throw out abuse at them. So it has ramifications because those organizations, it's the developers in those organizations that are going to bring their applications to Linux. You know, it's those people that are motivated that will make that happen. And if, and they, they're aware of what goes on in our communities, they see it. And if they don't want to be a part of it, then they're not going to bring their software to us. So we, we really need to, you know, weed those people out of our community and, and educate them and, and have them um, behave in a way that would be coming to having a conversation in person, not hiding behind a keyboard and just spraying abuse at people. I really want, want that over. Yep. It's a shame because there are so many awesome people in the Linux community and it only takes a few toxic individuals yep. to make the whole community look bad. It really does. You'd be, re you'd be surprised how few people can have such an impact in the perception that our community is uh, negative, toxic, you know, abusive, um, uh, and almost exclusively the people that behave in that way are not developers and are not con contributing in any meaningful way to any of this stuff. Their sole function, the joy that they get apparently is to be there just to tell everyone how awful they are and how terrible their decisions are, how wrong they are, you know, without any critical thought or assessment behind it. And it's just the worst. Yep. Agreed. So all of you lovely people who are still watching this, 
despite all of the thumbs down you gave for the bits about Mac OS and Windows. <laughs> you know, if you're still watching this and you recognize that behavior, uh, and maybe it's somebody you know, maybe you know them online, maybe you know them in person, maybe um, your contribution to our community would be to help educate those people as to how, you know, the, the impact that their, their behavior is having on, on um, developers like myself and other, others, you know, uh, other contributors and, and how we're perceived widely. Very well said. Yep. Definitely got to look. Um, I, you mentioned all these software companies. I know there's no magical one piece of software that's mm -hmm. going to, you know, put Linux into prime time. But is there something that you think uh, maybe could be important in affecting uh, Linux adoption more than so than another? Yeah, I think there's a few bits of software. I, a lot of people talk about, you know, the, the Adobe Creative Suite. I can't really talk to that because I've never used it. I've never used any of those products. I, I don't do that kind of work. I have recently started to get into video editing, but I know so little about it. Whatever it is their products do that the things I'm using don't do, I'm oblivious to because I, I literally know nothing about it. So <laughs> whatever I have at my disposal today is more than I need. Um, so I know that one crops up, but I think a lot of people ask for that without actually requiring it. I don't think there's many people that need those tools that are using Linux. I think the ones that would be most pivotal now is certainly from my personal experiences at work would be Skype for Business, which is sort of becoming Microsoft Teams. The amount of times I get invited to conference calls, not just Microsoft, by the way, but just generally you know, uh, that requires Skype for business or Microsoft Teams, having that would mean that I'd be able to uh, have an easier time um, having those conversations. Uh, so that would be uh, an important one. And I think despite the fact that LibreOffice is so good, you can't avoid the fact that Microsoft Office is just dominant. And I think if the Microsoft Office suite were available on the desktop, so I'm not talking about Office 365 here, I'm talking about the desktop suite. I think there is a large chunk of industry that would be able to move over. I think Teams and Office, an enterprise desktop level, I think that would enable more commercial success for the Linux desktop. And why is that important? That's important because they'll be paying distributions, in some cases, community distributions. We've seen Zorin be successful in municipalities around Europe, um, but also the likes of Canonical and Red Hat. And that would be money coming into those organizations to fund their desktop teams which would improve Linux further in order to, to get a better, bigger foothold into the enterprise desktop market, which is a market that's going to shrink, right? We're going to come to a point where there are only certain functions that you actually use a computer for. There'll be a whole raft of uh, employee that doesn't need a desktop or laptop computer to do their work anymore. You know, these mobile devices are going to get to a point where they'll be able to do the majority of what they need to do on those and it will be very sort of specific tasks like you know software development and sysadmin and orchestration um uh creative um functions you know or audio video digital um media those right. things i think you'll require a computer for um so yeah but i think enterprise adoption is going to be key to our ongoing success and sustainability well, I don't want to hear that the Linux desktop will shrink. <laughs> you know, that's not... Not I the mean, Linux desktop, the des desktop. So right. it doesn't matter whether it's Windows or Mac or Linux, just the the role that the desktop plays in the world is going to, going to shrink. 
I still don't want to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> no, neither do I. I can't imagine a world where I didn't have this fabulous bit of equipment in front of me yeah. that enables me to do so much, you know, or the, you know, the laptop equivalent. I would, I would hate to live in that world, but I th- think for some people that's going to become a reality, but I don't think it will be uh, a reality for the likes of you and I. Well, well, here comes the question. What do you think of when I say the year of the Linux desktop? <sighs> Well, what I'm actually thinking is something I can't share with you because I'm under NDA, but I actually had someone show me a slide that said precisely that a massive organization, and they had no idea of what that meme meant in the Linux community, but they showed me a slide about how it's the year of the Linux desktop. Uh, So that's what I'm thinking about right now. Um, I don't know the year of the Linux desktop. I mean, it's it's just such a a stupid meme now. I can't even hear those words and think about it in a in a constructive <laughs> in a way. way. Yeah. <laughs> um, what would that look like? Yeah, I, there there are too many things that would have to happen for that to be the case. You know, we we have the likes of Dell and Lenovo and HP selling. Um, uh, Ubuntu pre-installed on a range of desktop and laptop machines, most of which is in uh, the Far East and Southeast Asia and what have you. Um, I think, you know, uh, uh, a broader expression of that would be more of those devices available, um, trivially available in more geographies. Um, you know, I think if we saw all the tier one vendors shipping you know, a decent percentage of their laptops with a with a Linux desktop pre-install option. That would probably be some way to the year of the Linux desktop. You know, when we're a uh, a viable option for you know a class of user, and the right. class of user is going to be those skills that I was just talking about. You know, developers, sysadmins, DevOps, um, uh, creative professionals. I think that is going to be our heartland so if you could change one thing and only one thing about linux what would it be desktop linux sure i suppose it would be that magical unicorn thing that is that compelling reason why we should be running the the Linux desktop rather than Mac OS or Windows. So it's an as yet uninvented thing. And whatever it is, it needs to happen on Linux first. So that is the only place you can acquire it. So I can't believe I'm going to say these words, but you're welcome, Popey. Maybe it is a vr desktop experience or an ar desktop experience the the first place that that happens is in uh, an as yet unknown uncreated desktop environment for linux you know it could be i think it has to be something as sort of paradigm changing as that and i don't know what it is but it could be something like that (laughs) very nice so You have reasons why you chose to run Linux. You like to create things. Mm -hmm. Um, Thinking back on all of the reasons, not just one, but all of the reasons you chose to run Linux, do all of those reasons still apply today? Uh, Yes, I think they do. More so, in fact. Um, You know, when I was running Linux in the early days, um, it was awful. It was absolutely hideous. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> there was there was no computing parity with you know windows or os2 or mac os back then you know if you were running linux you were disadvantaged yourself quite considerably you know it was it, it's not like today just think about how many applications that are available on the linux desktop that um are, are available on the mainstream operating systems and how many of those are open source projects that have crossed over into the mainstream. Right. We've got VLC, which is the de facto media player on just about every platform, which is an open source project and excellently supported on Linux. 
we have the Firefox browser, which is available everywhere. I know other browsers are more um, dominant now, but that was, you know, the, the key one. Then we've got stuff like OBS. Can you imagine OBS, <laughs> right? That is the, the standard in sort of live streaming. And we have that too. And it does GPU encoding and all of the cool, cool stuff that's available, you know, that you can do on Windows. That is a really sophisticated bit of software. You know, when you is it telecast? Is that the commercial like equivalent? That's a multi thousand dollar uh, bit of software. And there's all of these people now doing everything with OBS. And you can buy webcams in the shop and there's an OBS logo on the back of the box. You know, there's there's all of this crossover. Um the fact that we've got Spotify for Linux, we've got Skype for Linux, we've got Slack for Linux, whatever your opinions about any of those products are, these are things that are household names that people know about, and we have them to the same feature level as the other platforms now. You know, Visual Studio Code for developers is the de facto code editor, and we have that available. For yep. so many years in my journey in Linux, we weren't even a second class citizen you know we 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 were we were the the the, the gutter trash you know we had nothing we had we had all of that free and open source software but we were all making a massive compromise in 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 the availability of the tools that we had for doing this here yep. we are we're you know having a video conference you know from intercontinental uh, video conference. And I, I know this is all working with all of my, it's just all just working, you know. It's kind of fabulous where we are now. And, you know, we talked about there are some gaps in some of the applications that are important to people. But then Steam, a few years ago, Steam came to Linux and look how much that's changed the landscape. I wasn't a PC gamer until Steam came to Linux and I've now got close to, 200 games in my steam library and i've got a gaming mouse and a gaming keyboard and this other <laughs> gaming thing here and i've got one two three four set i can see seven controllers in or out i've got this stream deck thing you know there's just all of this stuff now that's available i don't feel like a second class citizen i don't feel i'm making any compromises by choosing to run linux today all of the things that I want to be able to do, all of the software that I personally need access to, I have access to. And then all of those great qualities that I was looking for from those Unix operating systems 20, 25 years ago, I have available to me now. You know, I have the terminal and that rich portfolio of utilities and tools to make me super productive in my in my work day. So right. Yeah, we've come an awfully long way. And those people that are coming into Linux new today, welcome to the party. Isn't it fabulous? But boy, oh boy, you sh should have seen what it was like 20 years ago, man. It was awful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I believe it. I believe it. <laughs> okay, so is there anything else you would like to share with people? No, nothing, nothing else. You know, uh, watch this space, working on a few things. Um, and maybe maybe have something fun uh, in the not-too-distant future. Just a few things you're working on. Yeah, a few things. <laughs> How can people get in touch with you, Martin? Uh, well, um, probably Twitter is the best way. So I'm at M underscore WinPress on Twitter. So if you want to get in touch, that's a great way. I'm quite active on Twitter now, ever since uh, Google Plus shut down uh, I was sort of shifted my focus to Twitter, but I have a website called Wimpy's World, and at the top of that website there are icons for all of the places that, that I reside on the internet. So you'll find me, you know, on Mastodon if that's your thing, or Telegram, or you know, um, GitHub and uh, YouTube and the podcasts and various other things. So if you go to wimpysworld.com, you can find a number of places that I hang out online. Well, again, all of those tens of thousands of links will be in the show notes too. <laughs> uh, Martin, thank you so much for spending so much time with us today. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you for the chat. I always enjoy having a conversation with you. It's 
always uh, always entertaining and i never quite know where it's going to go so uh, uh my pleasure it's been fun well i wanted to take one moment to thank you personally for all of the effort and work that you've put in over the years uh, on everything that you've worked on we've just we've touched on some of the things but on everything that you've worked for i can't imagine the amount of time if we added it all up that you have donated or given freely of yourself and i just want to say i appreciate that well thank you very much and i i would like to extend that thanks to everyone in the communities that i'm involved in that also contribute equally that that enable all of this stuff to happen because it it's never one person it's groups of people that make these things happen and i can't achieve the things that i do and make the things that i do without the assistance of dozens and dozens of other people like me who are all doing the same thing. Very nice. Well, that's going to wrap it up. Thank you again, Martin. Thank you all for joining us this week as we spotlight the best thing about Linux, our community. Until next time, long live Linux. quick sound recording to check the levels make sure we're pretty much even sure sure so go ahead say something okay my name's martin wimpress i'm looking around my machine here to make sure everything's working and uh, earlier today i was essentially writing obs there you go <laughs> so you've been making the rounds on the podcast on youtube channels for interviews um one of the recent ones that is that you appeared on a JB Extra show called uh, Brunch. Yeah, let me get that right. Brunch with Brent. Did that so badly, and I didn't realize just how badly until. Quick one again. Sure. Say something real quick. Okay, this is me saying something quickly whilst I look at the gnome on uh, Rocco's shelf behind him. 